Hello, everybody. Hello, we're on. We have Russell Gilbrook with us today. Uh, episode 23. I wow, think. 23 podcasts. Subscribe to our channel, people. <laughs> um, we have Russell here and so much to talk about, really. Um, I saw you perform at a clinic many, many, many years ago. And um, at that clinic, you played to Earth Song by Michael Jackson. I love Michael Jackson and I just, it just hit me because you were really just in the pocket and grooving and you were all about that and I loved it. Um, and I'm wondering, does that, has that always been with you, this whole thing about it's about the song, firstly, and also I want to know your thoughts about social media and it had the effect on groove playing. So that last bit was what? So Instagram, yeah. Facebook, yeah. they're full of a lot of drummers who are just <laughs> and just, you know. Well, I mean, the thing is, I was taught right from an early age that music is about passion, expression, and creativity. That's it. Mm -hmm. Technique is only something that will take you so far, but it's not necessarily needed to create the three things I just said. Mm. Um, you know, there's plenty of musicians, I mean, famous musicians, great, highly respected musicians, who maybe not have the greatest understanding of what it is they're playing, but they don't need to, because when I've spoken to them about certain aspects of a song or a phrasing, I don't know, I'll just play it. And I love that because that means sometimes an understanding isn't as important as some people think it is. It just isn't. You know, they're all assets. If you do, I need to read. Well, if a reading gig comes up, yes, but I haven't had to read music now for 15 years. The only bit of reading that I've done is when I've been asked to play on people's albums and stuff, I've transcribed uh, some of the arrangements for myself. And even they might be wrong, but they're understandable to me. Mm. So, you know, if you want to play shows in the West End and stuff, you've got to be a reader. If you want to do cabarets and, and, and tours on uh, boats and stuff where there's reading involved, you've got to be a reader. Of course you have. But is it a necessity? No, it's a valuable asset. Mm. But one thing you can't take away from anybody is the fact that the passion, the creativity, and the expression you give as an individual is very personal and no one can take that away from you. So that means everyone has something to offer. And that's really what I feel defines a great player from a very good player. I, I, I think a very good player is someone who can do the job, do it very well, and no one's going to complain. A great player is the player that plays something and you just feel something magical about it. And unfortunately, as human beings, some people are born with that gift. Some people are um, able to bring that out at a later stage when they have more experience and they develop. And some people just will not get that magic out. No matter how well you play, they become a very good player. Okay. But there's room for everybody. <laughs> True. Depending on the kind of work you're doing, you don't need to be a great player. You just need to do the job. Like right. if, if, you are, if, if you are playing a boat, reading for people play cha-cha-cha, you know, just reading is enough. Correct. And how much is the groove important in your current gig with Uriah Hip? It's very important. It's about the whole feel of the essence of what it is you're putting across because the guys grew up, obviously, where the uh, complete and utter experimentation was going on in that classic rock feel. So what the guys are looking for is that certain feel. Of course, there's a technicality involved, like the double-handed shuffle I have to play in their famous hit, Easy Living. They've got another song, Return to Fancy, which is even faster. And the double-handed shuffle is very difficult for a lot of drummers because obviously the weak hand is involved. 
And in fact, for the audition, there were 240 drummers worldwide that went for the audition. Wow. And they had to whittle it down to the last 40, of which I was one of them. And it was, um, they were astonished, the amount of people that shied away from playing the double-handed shuffle. And they did a regular shuffle with the right hand and a two and four backbeat. And of course, it sounds completely different. But they're the small things that might seem small to the listener, but to a musician, it's completely different feel. And, you know, if people don't like it, you're not going to win the day with it. So exactly. the feel of um, classic rock for Heap was all about um, understanding where the band started. Of course it is. Understanding the transitions of everything that's gone on in a lot of years with Heap and, and being able to... Um, fit your way into a set of musicians have a particular way of playing. You know, I played with many a bass player where I just cannot get the quarter note feeling with me. And yet I played with Trevor Boulder, bless him, who sadly passed away. And it was like putting on um, a hand fitted knitted glove. I didn't have to think about the timing, the phrasing, nothing. All I could th um, enjoy with the fans and the music and they're the special things that you look for in a musician where you don't have to fight where the quarter note is all you're doing is playing music you come together as one and of course the magic is there then. exactly i just have one more question here sorry yeah. <laughs> uh how much of a uh, of a liquor's lake fan were you before you you joined the hip well it's funny actually because my whole career took me down a completely different path okay. to rock and to the big session top 40, if you like, um, um, touring scene because of my upbringing, which we may come to a bit later. Uh, when I, when uh, Uriah Heap came across, it was one of those bands where I heard the song, but I didn't associate it with the band. And then when I delved more into what the band was all about, if you listen to Lee Kerslake as a drummer, he was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, a powerhouse, some innovative rhythms that he came up with. You know, it was a single- My favorite rock drummer of all time. Pardon? My favorite rock drummer of all time. Oh, he's incredible, yeah. but he, he gets forgotten about. It's a bit, yeah. there's a few uh, drummers who I feel um, definitely warrant a higher respect, but get blown away by the so-called Ian Pace, John Bonham, you know, the typical older guys um, that what can happen is you can get catapulted in your name as a, as a uh, individual drummer. And then the others get left behind just because the, they become the flavor for, for so long. Um, but Lee was uh, outstanding. That's why, you know, he ended up um, joining Ozzy, Great, great singer, immense singer. What a voice he's got and what a songwriter as well. I mean, he's such a talented man. Um, but as a drummer, he did get left behind. It's a shame because when you hear his drumming uh, back then, it was just fantastic. It was. Well, thank you. Enough of him. Now back to you. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Kira. Um, I just wanted to ask you about how it all started. I read that you started drumming when you were four. That's right, yeah. Apparently, see, I was born, not many people know, I was born with uh, club feet. So my, my feet was like this. My feet were born upside down and inside out. Wow. So I had to have, uh, I went to Great Ormond Street and I, I was the first person in the world to have this particular experimental operation on my feet. So they completely changed all my tendons around, snapped the feet up. And for a year, I was held up, um, upside down uh, in calipers to force my feet to try and set in a certain way. Um, and when I was about two and a half, I had to keep um, plaster casts on my feet set for a year. So I used to just drag myself around. And my dad played uh, as a very good keyboard player, not professionally, but a very good keyboard player. And so when he used to play the piano and tap his foot, I used to cr drag myself over there and put my hand on his foot for the timing. He just stay there for an hour. And then my mum got the hoover out. I used to leg it over to the hoover, put my head on the hoover because of the vibrations. And then obviously if the radio was on, I'd get um, 
a plastic um, dish out, some spoons, and I'd play to the melody. Obviously, I didn't understand drumming, so I'd just play to the, the melody, and they said, oh, I think we've got a drummer here. And so when I got to four, when I was three inches high, because I'm only a tiny, tiny person, when I was three inches high, uh, they said we'd better take for drum lessons. So I had my first drum lesson when I was four, um, and I got, I, I grew up, my dad was uh, a big jazz nut, and my teacher, the great Bob Armstrong, bless him, um, he came up from jazz, really jazz, and that jazz, funk, rock, instrumental type thing. So that, that's what separated me, you see, from all this other session scene that was going on. I didn't know anything about it. So I was Bob's number one dep, if you like. So I did all of his dep work and stuff like that. But cool. it was all mainly jazz. And then uh, I dep Jesus Christ Superstar in the West End when I was 12. I sight read wow. that. He nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> Yeah, no, I remember, I remember, um, well, see, what happened was, um, when I went to Bob for eight years, from the age of six to 14, and Bob, back then, used to teach a slightly different way. It wasn't wrong or right or anything like that. It was just a different type of way. He had a fantastic way of teaching the individual um, student. So he understood the student mentally and physically and had a great way of, no, we're going to take you down this path for this moment. And as you grow, you might change it. He did it for different students he had. And basically, I, because I, I, I feel as I was born playing the drums, I, it was like a duck to water. I just sucked everything in and I got really good really quickly. And reading was nothing to me. I could read anything. It made no difference to me. So I remember this time when um, I got a phone call. Everybody was couldn't do it. The drummer was ill. Everyone couldn't do Jesus Christ Superstar. Bob recommended me. The MD didn't know any different. Called me up and we were up there, right? And so we got there an hour before the matinee. It was on a Saturday. It was a matinee. And we go to the bar and the, the MD comes legging it out, all flustered with the... the um, um, folder in his hand, all the music, starts speaking to my dad. And after 10 minutes, my dad stopped him. He said, well, you're talking to me like I'm a drummer. I said, well, where's it? who are you then? He said, well, I brought the drummer's my son sitting there. And this little <laughs> dog sitting there with a glass of Coke, and he, he nearly fainted. He said, you bloody mind up. He, he said, this is a serious show in London. We, we, you know, we've got 45 minutes, the curtain's going to go up. Oh, don't wait, you can do it, you can do it. Well, the guy wasn't happy at all. He came over eventually came over, sat down and said, introduced himself, look, son, are you, are you right? Are you going to be your... I said, yeah, I could do it, no problem. Blah, 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 blah. Well, look at the parts, you know, some bits in 7-4, and you know, it's going to be awkward, but the... I said, I don't even need to look at it. And he nearly fell over backwards. Oh. Mean, I don't need to look at it. No, I'm just going to read it. What do you, what do you mean, read it? <sighs> just read it. And I went in and just I read it. It made no difference to me. Um, and it was the same when Bob was depping Evita and uh, when David Essex was in Evita. And there was this one, I can't remember the track now, there was this one song where David Essex, uh, who's actually a very good singer, he was singing like a, um, a cross rhythm over one of the tracks that was in 7-4. And Bob couldn't get it. For some reason, he was throwing him because he had the record there. He's learning, he's going to do a dep. And he was panicking, he was flustered. And he rang my dad up and said, can you get Russ down here? <laughs> he got me down there, so I was all down there like that, about 12 years old. And Bob said, just do us a favour, Russ, and I'm just going to put this on you. Just play these 16 bars, can you? All oh, right, yeah, boom, no, just play them like you. Little sod. He went, <laughs> three, three hours playing, that. I can't get it. He comes in and just sides read it. <laughs> and um, obviously it helped him out, because then when I played it, he understood where the beat was. Uh, fell in everything like that, um, and so th this um, that road took me down. Obviously, the depths for Bob, and then I did loads of you know I did Helen Shapiro, I did Bernie Clifton, Tommy Cooper, I did the usual old school bread and butter stuff, which was fantastic because it was an experience for me. I just wanted to play the drums. I didn't care whether it was an Irish jig or or speed metal. You know, at that time, I just loved playing the drums. You know, and. Um, but the, the, my, my um, professional career took me down a road that kept me separate to that big scene that was going on. And that really never came till really, really late. Um, I don't, 
I haven't got a hang up about it. I do wish that, I wonder what would have happened if I'd have got into that scene. But um, it's like anything in this business, you know, you take what you can when you can. No one deserves anything. You know, the opportunities come and they go and sometimes they don't come. Uh, and sometimes you miss them and sometimes you're not ready for them. You've just got to do what you do. The music business is, isn't about being the greatest, you know, it's more about being the nicest person because no one yes. wants to book the arsehole and go on tour with them. <laughs> I remember talking to Kenny Aronoff, he's a good mate of mine. I, I said to him, Kenny, you know, you're the number one rock um, session guy in, in LA. You know, you, you beat everybody off. I said, why is it? He said, Russ, let me tell you. He said, there's guys that can play me under the table. He said, you know what the difference is? I give the producer what they want the first time. I'm a nice guy. I arrive on time. I've got a great sound. He said, but you know really why they book me? I create a fantastic vibe. And you can't get that from everybody. No matter how good you are, if you don't create that vibe and you do create that vibe for that producer, well, what's the producer going to do? He's going to call you every time. Because that's what they're after, the vibe, which you go back to the feel, right? You want the right vibe with the right producer to create the right feel so the track sounds great, so the producer gets his money and gets rebooked, the artist is happy, and so are the session musicians he booked. So sure. I don't know how I even got to that. How <laughs> 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 so, did you start? I went starting from there and I went there. Yeah. We were talking about the lasagna recipe, and then we ended up talking oh, about candy, yeah. candy <laughs> Aronoff. But well, that's that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> and how long have you been playing with the Heap now? Uh, Thirteen years. Thirteen years. So, it 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 was it like let's say that your your first classic rock band you played, or have you played with a classic rock band before? Oh, I've done lots of bits and pieces before. Um, But it's the first sort of what I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm like a, a full member. I'm a director of the company, the whole bit. I have a fifth say, you know, Mick, even though he's the founder member, he doesn't have, um, you know, the final say on anything. We respect his point of view because he's the founder member. Of course you do. But he's quite happy for five guys to have equal shares about everything. Cool. And, and that completely changed my, um, I had to get used to that mindset because for so long as a session guy you just shut up yeah you, know, you want me to play with a little finger i'll play with a little finger if it's going to do the job and give me money right but in this i've got to learn to open my mouth have to say not be afraid to have an input be creative on all levels even about the thousand pound tour bus a day i've got to have a say whether we have it or not and that uh, crew member's got to be fired and blah 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 and the t-shirts and so it's a whole new world to me that i've had to learn and i'm, I'm very grateful for it But as far as heap of concern, it's a great family, a great band. And when you uh, look at the history of it, I mean, it's, uh, what can I say? I'm so happy to, and I never say I'm lucky. When people say, oh, you're off lucky. But no, I'm not. I work my backside off to get where I got. And I beat off 240 people to get into that band because I believed I had something to offer and I wanted to find a vehicle to take me on the best journey of my life. Jesus Christ, I can't get anything better than that. A classic rock band, one of the big four, and I'm out there playing to thousands of people, and lucky for me, the band loved me, the fans took to me as well, because if the fans didn't take to me, I could have been out, because the exactly. fans are everything. Without fans, you've got no band. <laughs> exactly, true. I wanted to ask you about um, something you mentioned at the beginning about creativity. I just, it really got me thinking because I think it's such an important aspect of drumming that possibly isn't talked about enough is having the time at the beginning when you're starting drumming to just get creative and just play and just see where things take you. Mm. And I just wondered when you were starting off playing, did you get into bands straight away? I mean, you were really young. So when did you start you know, playing with other bands? And did you like allocate time to just play and see, discover like what kind of player you wanted to be? Okay, yeah, that's a great question actually. And I have to be a hundred percent honest and say, from the age of six, the first band I joined was actually a duo, but still a band. 
I was earning £30 a week when I was six. So from the ages of six, actually performing in front of people and playing with another musician, to about the age of, um, what would I say? I reckon, yeah, I have to say 18. From six to 18, I just allowed the music business to take me where I was. I didn't understand being creative. So I was learning and the learning went to playing and went back to lessons and debt there and then a gig there and then lessons. So all I did was soak in information. Bob said, do this. So I did that. And then I did that gig and you expect you to play like that. So I played like that. And I went, so I had no mature thought process of it. And then my first real big gig, if you like, was playing with Alan Price. He used to be in the animals, the keyboard player in the animals. Mm. And I, I was doing a West End show called Handicap. Now, again, it fell on me because everybody was busy. No one could do it. And there was a, f a famous MD in London at the time called David Furman. Now, David was renowned to be so meticulously particular about all his musicians. He wouldn't put up with anything from anyone. It had to be the right one to do the right job. And Bob put me up for it. So I went up. It was actually the Shaftesbury Avenue where we were doing um, um, like a pre-production thing with the, the musicians. And I turned up and David looked at me like, well, you thought it was a piece of dog turd turned up. And he really looked down at me like that. Because I turned up, what was I? I turned up, I was like 17 years old. And I turned up, he's expecting, I suppose, I don't know, you know, a proper adult that's experienced. You know, I wrote all this out, it's difficult. It's clocking spill, there's cowbell, ratchets, wood blocks, a whole thing and bit, and, you know, some plant. And because I was an unknown um, person, and this is the thing about the music business, people don't like to give people chances because it upsets them. And we all understand that. But if the chances aren't given, people don't learn from them, and then people don't end up having an opportunity. It's a shame, but it's the way it goes. So anyway, we turn in, and I... You know, it gave me a hard time. I just sat there and just played it. And I went, unfortunately, back then I was, I was a bit cocky because I was very good reading. And I pulled him up on some mistakes. That, you know, I'm reading through it. That's not right. That's not, I'm just, he looked, what? <laughs> hey, boy. Hey, boy, what are you talking about? It's not right. Well, I said, well, if you look over here, but, but, oh, yeah, well, just change that bit. I was probably rushing. But, uh, and, um, <laughs> but anyway, I ended up playing it. And it was as good as gold. Um, and I ended up doing the um the show which was handicapped but it was the music was written by alan price of course he was in it well during the course of me playing that his drummer unfortunately had been done for drugs and put in prison for six months so he was doing a tour after the uh, show had finished in london and he, he just approached me and said what are you doing i was like then i was 18 and he said uh, what are you doing i said i'm not doing anything Do you fancy uh, coming on tour yeah, all right. How many gigs? 150 gigs. I was like, what? <laughs> Proper theatres, like big 2,000. Oh, yeah. And then we do 10,000 in Greece. And then we're going to go, okay, okay, okay. I said, well, where's the music? Oh, I don't read music. I don't do all that. Back then, I'll give you the cassette of the show, learn it. So he gave me the cassette of the show. And after a week, I rang him up. I said, Alan, yeah, I'd just like to uh, ask, on that third number there, what are you doing? Russ. Booked you to play the drums, listen to music and play. Well, I've never heard that before. You know, it's always been that thing of you know, play what's written, you know, don't forget that, that fin at there, mustn't be too. Blah, 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 blah. But he actually was the first one to turn and say, Russ, I've booked you to play the drums, play. And he really brought out me as a player. And that's the first time I could express myself as me with the creativity. And so from that time, really, I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, what am I going to do? So I had to analyse the music properly to get an understanding of what I would put in, because up to that point, it had been what everybody else wants me to play. It's the first time they've said, Russ, well, come on in. And it was like, I've got to get a hand on this. And it worried me for uh, another week before we went to rehearsals up in London. It really did worry me that I thought, how do I go about actually ignoring that drama to a certain degree and putting my own input in. But 
it, it, it resulted and it was it did the world of good for me and from then you had the same agent that booked Alan Price booked Chris Barber and so Chris Barber asked me to join him flipping it my dad he had Art Attack in one of his favourite bands I like to listen to the old school Baby Dodds strict New Orleans syncopators I listened to Ziggy Modalis to get the second line drumming and that's a whole new world for me um, and even though I'm renowned to be a very very hard hitter um, when I joined Chris Barber's band, we were playing in front of 5,000 people, and he's massive in Europe, um, playing the Dixieland Jump, and I absolutely adored it, because the swing feel gives you the same buzz and energy and excitement as it does if you're playing rock or a really cool funk thing. You get the same, uh, you know, just the same feel, which is what I love. That's what I play drums for. And it was um, an experience in the end. <laughs> but I, I would not surpass it for anything. You know, playing with some of I played with Howard Ashby. He came on tour with us for three weeks in Germany. Howard Ashby was one of Duke Ellington's saxophone players. And I was at breakfast and I was, oh, Howard, yeah, boy, what do you want, boy? I, I, need, I need to know about me, you know, me jazz, it's all about the right hand. Please just tell me what it is you, you guys listen to. Suckering up from someone like that, he's not going to... You know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> doing fine, boy. All I want to do, I just want to hear that right. I want it to swing, swing, swing. And he was such a funny character. Um, and having things like that, because even though jazz is really difficult in England to earn a living doing it properly, it's a valuable asset to any musician to just soak in everything from anybody. Just to enhance what you've already got because i don't believe in styles i came to a situation when i was about 27 years old and i went what's all this style rubbish what are you talking about is you taking drugs or something i said no i said i don't believe in styles i said i can play a jazz rhythm in rock or funk so what does it make it i'm playing a phrase within the music i'm playing at the time so you know, when you've got someone like um, Art Blakey and his 24-inch ride set, when it's doing that and he's really laying into it, like a heavy metal player. Hang on a minute. You know, all I'm doing is playing phrases within the music that I'm playing at the time. So that's why I, when I used to teach at BIM and I used to say all the students that I teach, you've got to learn everything because everything is intertwined so much you don't even realise. But if you miss out on that phrasing, how the hell can you introduce it? My first album I did was Wake the Sleeper in 2007, got released 2008 with um, Uriah Heap. And there was a middle bit of a song called Tears of the World, which is a shuffle. And in the middle, they were struggling for something. And I started keeping 6 8 middle. And I, for what? I played an Afro-Cuban 6-8. An Afro-8, a what? I said, shall I play it? So I played it for them. That's exactly what we need. <laughs> now, if I didn't have the experience of knowing what that was, it wouldn't have gone on the album, and everyone would have been happy. It made Trevor play the phrases of So I played it. I agree with that. Completely agree with that. Mm. So, since you, uh, did you stop teaching when you joined your hip or your hip, or it was a little bit before? Yeah, it was basically about six months into heap because we just got too busy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love it. I love. I, I loved my two years at BIM because I wanted to give the students there the real deal not the rubbish deal not the living the dream deal not the, the, the you know you've got to learn this and you've got i wanted to give them the real deal and every time we did some technical thing or uh um you know they do the today we're going to do keith moon blah blah blah, blah, blah. nine times out of ten there'll be something that comes up that i've already done and i could go well the reason why you do that is because 
in 1987, when I did a five-star record and the Plymouth thing came on like that, and I had to play like this, this is what we do, you know? So I gave them a real life situation based on what they were learning. And I felt as though they would relate to that, obviously far better, because it's real, it's actually happened. It's none of this, you know, left foot clave, but for when, for what gig? Why are you struggling for three months trying to do a left foot clave? <laughs> For what gig, for, for goodness sake? I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, one, one of the questions I got, I changed, I changed that because I teach a little bit different now, but one of the questions I used to get a lot was, why do I need the, rudiment, the rudiments for? Because nobody, everybody tells you to practice the rudiments, but they don't tell you where to use it, how to use it for, you know. So, yeah, that was the question, but why do I have to, to practice this? until the day I started realizing that the rudiments were part of my playing, even in grooves and fills and stuff. The moment I start, instead of telling them about the rudiments, I was like, how about this groove? How about this drum fill? And then later explain, this is a drum rudiment. They were like, oh, now I know why I have to practice it. You yeah, know? I think that's been an ongoing problematic thing. Uh, Probably the, the one of the top three or four problematic things for all drummers is about rudiments and how to apply them. Now, you've spoken to the wrong person here. <laughs> I am the person that has, if you can go on YouTube quite a few times, I've said, get hold of the rudiments, tear them up and throw them in the bin. And the, the reason why I say that is because it, it struck me when I was about 25 years old I wanted to really move my playing more forward. At 18, I discovered creativity properly, right? I started to become better as a, a, a person, an individual. I realized that I didn't sound like any other drummer and I wanted to expand and get better and better and better as, you, as we all do and I still do now. But at 25, I suddenly thought, hang on a minute. Let me look at these rudiments. Now at the time, Bob took me through the 26 American rudiments. I know there's, what is it, 47 now or something? Well, the rudiments are 40, but they're more, they, they're, they're the hybrid rudiments that are like yeah, 500. I, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Right. So, let's just say there's 40 rudiments in, right? Now, <laughs> get this. Right? Forget the press roll. We're not putting that into it, right? But if you look at the rudiments, now, I've been an advocate for this since I was 25 years old. Hundreds of drum clinics I've done, I've said the same thing. I can't be proven wrong. There's only two rudiments, and they look at me like I'm mad. So there isn't, singles and doubles. Everything else is a combination of. Now, what you've got to bear in mind is if you were to spend your hour's practice on 40 rudiments, how long are you spending on each one? If you were to spend an hour's practice on two rudiments, how, are you sp uh, how much time are you spending on each one? So which one are you going to improve better on? Right, well, if you improve better on singles and doubles, then the others, it's just a phrase of them, they're going to be better because the foundation's better. <laughs> Among the people that can't play anything with a double in very well, it's because the, 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 the second hardest thing to play on the drums, which is a double stroke, you're not perfecting it. It becomes hard, so you switch off. You rely on a double stroke. Uh, you on, uh, rely on bounce. You can't rely on bounce. A double stroke is supposed to be sounding like two singles in, in, in a you know, basic form. And the people are glitching over that and trying to do the pat of flower flowers. And pat of flower flower, I can't even tell you when I even heard one. <laughs> you know, now if you're in a rudimental situation and marching up and down, of course, we need all the phrases to express ourselves. You're on one drum. But we've moved away from one drum for a lot of years now. We're on a drum kit where other aspects come into it. And so therefore, you know, are all singles. Doubles and singles. And when I think about playing a, a little phrase at the end, left, right, left, right, right, foot, foot. You know, is that a seven stroke roll or is it not? Well, I don't know. How do you want to, we, you don't do that, you play it. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I believe that you, you get a, and what I did do is what happened to my plane, is I got a faster, quicker, and more excitable, um, um, what's the word? Um, I got better, quicker, faster, and I got more excited about my development because all I played was singles and doubles in series of 16th notes, 30 second notes, depending on the measure of time, how fast it is, subdividing the lot. 
and not thinking about whether it's a five, seven, eight, ten stroke roll, flam, flam accent, it didn't matter what it was. I'm playing fluidity between left and right and then mix it up with the feet because the more fluid you are, the more musical you are. You know, you put the dynamics in there, but you can't be thinking in set phrases and then going, right, I'm now going to go paradiddle, 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 paradiddle. You know, it's nice to get a development of something, but I've never heard one drummer ever play that. And when they talk about Steve Gabb playing it, he doesn't play in a paradiddle way because his dynamics are so good and his touch is so good, it's almost disguised. But yeah. people go paradiddle, 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 paradiddle. But who well, plays that in a groove? Nobody plays it in a flaming groove. <laughs> and then they do a drum fill. I've never heard that on one record. I played by one drummer, right? 63 countries in about 800 flipping festivals. Never once have I heard it. And, and it just infuriates me because you're investing your time, you're investing your time into doing something. But invest a time then into a phrase that actually someone would play. And make that sound meaningful and, and groovy. It's far better to work on those things. You know, rather than which you'll never use in a million years. I don't understand where that's going to get a drum. I really don't. That's just my take. I'm a bit controversial on it. No, but that's great. That's amazing. That, that's, that's, the best, that's the best explanation we've ever got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean to say that no one should not practice paradiddle, paradiddle. Yeah, exactly. In my opinion, the paradiddle is one of the greatest rudiments to learn that accent to the, the diddle. And this is something else that I'll tell you now. I only believe in two dynamics on a drum kit. I know that as drummers, we do play slightly different dynamics. We all know that. But when you listen to a drum part, you'll only hear two dynamics every single time. Because that's what, what makes it musical. The, the ghost notes are all identical. And then the accent's all identical. That's what makes it musical. Exactly. And I've heard record, record, record. And all I could hear are the accents and the ghost notes. And the accents and the ghost notes. And the I'm really the sorry, but we have to finish because we're oh, going to no! run, run out of time. Yeah, sorry we're about that. We're going to run out, but it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm I love so it. Bad. I want to tell everybody everything. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. It was amazing. I loved it. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No Thank problem. you. It was Thank amazing. You. I really appreciate it. Kira. Thank you guys as well. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take it easy. See you next time. Have a good one. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.